All right, we're going to go ahead and get uh, tonight's meeting started. This is the regular board meeting for the Cedar Rapids Community School District, and it's Monday, February 8th, 2016. And with that, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Would somebody read the approval of the agenda? Yes, uh, I motion that the agenda of Monday, February 8th, 2016, Board of Education meeting be approved as set forth and that each item be is considered ready for discussion and or action. Okay, and I should uh, mention this is a revised agenda that we're, we'll be pulling BA 16197 from the agenda. It's the agreement with um, Jefferson High School as the Athletic Booster Club at Kingston. So, so it's the approval of the revised agenda. Larry, just a reminder that Director Ann Hall is with us via phone this evening. Great, and is he on the line? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, so, and is there a second for the revised agenda? Second. And uh, this is a roll call vote. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Jacobo? Aye. Director Meisterling? Aye. Director Jansen? Aye. President Laverty? Aye. Next, we'll turn it over to Dr. Buck for his report. Yeah, so I'd like to start with Year of Action Task Force. So we had our first meeting last week, and there were probably 80 stakeholders or so in the room, parents, teachers, uh, students. I mean, it was just a really nice, broad cross-section of our community. And uh, we spent uh, 6.30 to 9.30, so think about that, volunteer work from 6.30 to 9.30. Uh, we talked about um, growth mindset, so how do we think about providing even better experiences for our kids. Uh, we talked about how theory of actions really work, and we talked um, also about uh, where we are with our current goals and metrics and what we would like to do going forward. So it was really a great discussion, so that was our first meeting. Our next meeting, if you'd like to come and observe, you're welcome to do that. It is the 17th of February from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock here at the ELSC, but we're making good progress. Best hope here is when we think about delivering on the promise of excellence for all and all of our students, what would it take in terms of a theory of action? What are 6 to 8 to 10 big ideas that, if done well, would really deliver on this problem of excellence for all? So uh, this idea of excellence for all. So it was a really good uh, first meeting. Uh, I have a few other announcements tonight. I'm pleased to congratulate the Washington Boys Swimming Team on winning their 53rd consecutive district title last weekend. Uh, some of us weren't even born when that streak began, so <laughs> it's certainly something to celebrate. Uh, we want to remind everyone that Wednesday, February 10th, will remain an early dismissal for students. So that's already scheduled on the district calendar. This date will not, will not be used as a weather makeup date. Secondary students will be dismissed at 12.30 and elementary students will be dismissed at 1.30. Staff will participate in professional learning that afternoon and that's uh, what's been scheduled for that date uh, for a long time. Iowa Big is sponsoring a showing of the film Paper Tigers on Wednesday, February 17th at CSPS. The screening will begin, will be from six to nine. The film follows a year in the life of an alternative school that changed the way in which they discipline students using a trauma-informed approach that seeks to break the cycles of poverty, violence, and disease that students face. Um, and yeah, so there it is. And um, more than 175 area educators will descend on the Cedar Rapids Nubo neighborhood this Saturday, February 13th to share best practices, network, and work together to shape the future of education. It's one of five ed camp sites across Iowa that day, and Cedar Rapids location was the only location to sell out. So educators will gather at the Geonetric Building for an open forum approach to conferencing where participants pitch topics and sessions upon arrival. A schedule is built on the spot, and teachers may choose among the topics that best meet their needs and interests. We're pleased to be one of those sponsors. If you've not ever seen one of these, it's absolutely amazing. You put 175 people in a room. You say, what would you like to learn more and talk about today? Items get generated, and then they pick a list, and away we go, and that's how the conference gets built. So it's really an organic experience. So we're excited about that this Saturday. And the annual district climate surveys will launch this week to parents, employees, and high school students. Uh, this measurement focuses on such aspects of education as academic preparation, school operations, school leadership, safety and behavior, and parent engagement. Uh, the survey will be active through February 26th. Anyone not receiving a link by email this week can find it posted on the website. And I want to thank everyone in advance for taking the time to participate. So that's the report. Thank you, Dr. Buck. Uh, any board reports tonight? I, I do have uh, one announcement. So given the legislature is uh, in session talking about school funding, we do have a charter bus 
leaving on Wednesday, this Wednesday, it's an early out day, and so we'll be taking about 40 or so, 45 students that are mostly high school students and some adult chaperones to the Capitol and talking with our local legislators and learning from them uh, their perspectives of school funding issues and other issues in the state of Iowa. And so I want to thank uh, Kathy Ulrich and uh, others, Mary Ellen and Dr. Buck himself for helping pull all these students together. So that, that should be exciting and uh, there is information out there that uh, the district has put out, I believe it's on the website as well, um, just basic information about impact of school funding on the Cedar Rapids School District and more will be forthcoming soon, um, hopefully for patrons and for stakeholders to get a hold of our local legislators about the importance of school funding. So that's that. All right, with that, we'll move ahead with uh, communications, delegations, and petitions. I have two requests, and uh, I'll just remind those coming to speak before the board um, that uh, you have five minutes to speak. Please give us your name and your address. Um, and uh, related to any specific people or personnel issues, just keep them uh, in general terms and not about a specific person. So, Jeff Foster, if you would like to approach the podium over there. Good evening. Um, what I'd like to oh, talk... Just, your, just state your name and your address, oh, please. My, my name is Jeff Foster. I live at 3209 Tamara Drive, Southwest, Cedar Rapids. Um, what I would like to talk with you about tonight, I am a Cedar Rapids uh, School District employee, retired employee of 34 and a half years custodial maintenance, and I've currently been a crossing guard for three years. It is my understanding in the, pers in the personnel section of the agenda tonight that uh, you are being asked to uh, give a raise to one specific individual, a substantial raise. Um, as a district employee, I've received the emails asking about the reorganization in lieu of less state aid and giving one individual a substantial raise, um, I think is sending a mixed message to other district employees as well as the community in general. Um, two years ago when the other employee, virtually all other employee groups received a 3% raise. Crossing guards received no raise at all. Last year, when virtually everyone received a raise, we received six cents an hour. Three cents an hour over the last two years um, is uh, a little ludicrous in my mind. So I would ask that when you approve the personnel agenda, that uh, you think about the message that you're sending to other district employees as well as the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. We appreciate your comments. Next, we have uh, Jan Janelle McGovern. Good evening, my name is Janelle McGovern. My address is 2207 Fox Trail Drive Northeast, and I am here today as the president of the Cedar Rapids Council PTA. This year on February 17th, as a Founders Day event for our PTA, we are hosting a trip to Des Moines to visit with our legislature regarding school funding for our district. We are inviting all PTA members, parents to come with us um, to learn more and also to convey the needs of our children, of our students in our community. Wanted to make everyone aware of that and all PTA members are welcome to join us. Thank you, Janelle, we appreciate that information. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, consent agenda. Are there any um, items on the consent agenda that anybody would like to pull for questions or further consideration? Okay. John? Gary? I would like to pull um, the personnel report in, in uh, specifically the uh, the uh, and I'm looking for the item number. Um, sorry, I had it. Sixteen oh nine. Six sixteen oh oh nine dash twelve. I believe that's in. Okay, With and the do you have a change in position? 
Okay. I missed that last part. So, so the change of position? Yes, uh huh. Is that something, Dr. Buck, that you can address or? Uh, sure, yeah, so we have a position in there that's uh, new to us, position in human resources, and so this is, um, we can speak about this position specifically or we can speak about this in general. And so the general idea here is anytime we have uh, openings in a department, we look at how can we provide even better service and better optimize and align those services, and that's really what we try to do each and every time. And we do it with an eye towards could a restructuring lead to a reduction in cost? And so that may mean that an individual position, uh, the, the pay for that position changes, generally associated with a significant increase in responsibility. And so um, uh, this is an example where we've realigned uh, HR, we've added additional uh, responsibility and workload to a position, and we have a net, at, at worst it'll be net even in the HR department, but we think we'll actually see a reduction in cost, and that's a combination of a position that's been vacant and um, some retirement um, that's coming up. And so once you realign and readjust all of that, uh, the net effect here is uh, at, at, at worst cost neutral, but likely will actually lead to a cost savings. So we have an eye in this entire process on uh, anytime we have openings, can we improve service and can it be less expensive? I mean, that's very common, so. Gary, does that answer uh, a question that you would have? Um. Well, uh, I appreciate the explanation, but uh, I still have concern, uh, and some of it was expressed in the uh, public uh, comments. Uh, we don't know. I've been talking with, and as many board members, to legislators in saying that uh, anything less than 3.75, we are going to have to... Uh, it will affect personnel, and we will probably uh, end up, or we will end up uh, re reducing our teaching staff. Uh, when we're sending that message to our teachers uh, and to our legislators, and then we come out uh, with uh, a salary increase uh, like this, it... Um, it's a little hard for them, I believe, staff, and uh, there may be some pushback from the public. Until I, uh, I would like this, uh, this tabled until we have a firm handle on what the legislation uh, uh, allow for growth is going to be, and until we have a handle on what we're doing with, um, with staff. That's, that's my opinion. Even recognizing this is cost neutral or likely actually results in a savings? I, mean, I think uh, that's, that's the articulated point of this discussion. I, um, I understand that, but I would, uh, I guess I need a further, I need to see it on paper. I need a further explanation to really, to see how this actually would all work out as a cost savings. Um, but so Gary, so Gary, what, what are you making a motion to, to table a specific item within the personnel? Report? I am, I am, I am making the motion to table BA sixteen O O slash C at this time. So this would require a second to Gary's motion. Is there anybody that would like to second that to table this? Gary, I, I don't see a, a second in the room, so the motion fails. So um, we'll go ahead and consider this as part of the personnel report. So again, any, any other items that anybody would like to pull for further consideration or discussion? All right, seeing none, so we'll go ahead and uh, vote on the consent agenda, which is a roll call vote. Uh, does anybody have a motion to to vote on this? Motion to approve consent as, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Again, this is a roll call. Director Jacobo. Aye. Director Meisterling. Aye. Director Jansen. Aye. Director Anhalt. Nay. President Laverty. Aye.
All right, with that, we'll go ahead and move into the uh, administration portion, and we'll turn this over to Dr. Buck. Oh, school calendar. school calendar. Yeah, so we are collecting information on the school calendar. So we're uh, we're in the midst. So the last uh, the last meeting we uh, talked uh, uh, at great length about the school calendar, and there were a number of questions that emerged relative to the school calendar. And I would say probably the biggest ideas are uh, digging into the transportation question and what that might cost relative to. Um, uh, if we run the buses at the regular time and what that would do with child care so we're digging into that we've also sent a survey out to the community because there was a specific question about what is the real interest is it a.m. or p.m. and which day of the week and so we have that information collected and then we were also uh, charged with coming up with a creative solution and uh, we were in the throes of the creative solution although I think that one is probably tapered off so uh, not that we're out of creativity, but just that it may not be doable in the short term, but maybe in a little bit longer term. So with that, I uh, would just ask that this plea, it, it needed to come back around because it was tabled the last time. So we wanted to make sure we honored that. I uh, would just ask that this could be deferred until we make sure uh, we have all the information together in a way that makes sense to present that to the board at a future meeting. So we would defer this until our next board meeting or until in a, a future specific meeting or uh, really unknown? Yeah, so I would, say, I, I would say we probably will have the information together for the next meeting. Um, we would absolutely have it together for the March meeting, but I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be surprised and a little bit disappointed if it takes us that long. Okay. I, I think we'll be back next time. All right, so we need to do a voice vote for deferring this. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All right, so all of those in favor of deferring the school calendar discussion until at least the next board meeting and maybe the board meeting after that signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same. Abstain? All right, the motion passes, so we'll defer that. Next, we'll move on to the Safe, Equitable, and Thriving Set Task Force. And Dr. Buck, I'll let you take the lead on that. Yeah, so there's a community group that really, um, this group started to pull together probably, what, five months ago, Trace? Would that be about right? And really trying to take a look at a number of issues as it relates to uh, how do we provide for a uh, community that's uh, safe and thriving? And it sort of started out with uh, kind of a violence mitigation, I think, sort of conversation, but it has evolved into taking a look at all kinds of things related to po poverty. So uh, education, uh, housing, I mean, it just goes on and on. It's really exciting. So the, the um, city council has already passed this and has established the task force. Uh, and we're excited to be a partner in this work. So really what we're bringing forward tonight is a resolution that's in support of the task force that's already been put in place by the city. Uh, Trace has been, uh, in, Trace Pickering's been intimately involved in that. Paul Hayes has been intimately involved in that. Uh, our role will be heavily, as you might guess, in the education environment part of that, but we'll uh, obviously lend support to as the city sees fit um, with other dimensions of it. So. I don't know, John, if you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think, you know, as the um, resolution supporting this says, I mean, we will give our expertise. We will give reasonable resources to support the work. Um, we'll provide the educational district data that's within the law so they can have data to use with this. Um, we'll make ourselves available to them and use our communication channels as appropriate. I mean, really, this is a collective community sort of effort and um, trying to do what we can to make this a great community for all of our children who will eventually be great leaders and uh, employees and hopefully business owners and citizens in our community. So they, we know they come from uh, oftentimes backgrounds with poverty, violence, mental health issues, and all kinds of things that um, um, are distractors to them succeeding in their lives. And anything we can do to help support this will be terrific. Um, one thing, and, and Trace, after uh, being at the Iowa Big uh, meeting the other night, it is amazing what our own students come up with in terms of ideas. I'm just, I'm floored when I listen to some of their creative solutions to problems. And I would hope that as part of this task force, we as a district sit back and go, okay, we as adults have our ideas, but what do our own students have as concepts that might help improve uh, Cedar Rapids as a community or our schools as a school district? Um, they're, they're just so uh, innovative in what they, they think of, and they're the ones that 
have to live um, you know, in the community and want um, specific outlets to make their lives better. So hopefully we'll use them in some way. And any other comments about this? I know some of you have been involved with other task forces or serve on other boards and as a community, so no? All right. Well, I think um, unless there are any other comments or conversations, um, this is a voice vote as well in support of this. So all of those in favor of the supporting resolution for the safe, equitable, and thriving set task force is written, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the same sign. Abstain. All right, seeing that, the motion does pass. So thank you all for that. Um, we'll move over to learning and leadership and learning supports update with uh, and student behavior with Paul Hayes. Yes, thank you. I've asked Ellen Day Williams, our manager of student discipline and attendance, to talk with you tonight. Um, Ellen has shared some data with the board that provides some rationale for our emphasis on developing a um, more restorative approach to discipline. So Ellen's going to share more information about restorative practices and what steps we have taken and will be taking. Good evening. I think I shared some information with you um, via handouts regarding um, some data that just kind of looked at our suspension data from 2014-15 uh, in comparison with our data for this year. I don't know if you had any questions about that. Thank you for sharing that. I will say that. And um, when you disaggregate that data, it really helps us narrowly define how we want to um, employ different practices to move in a different direction. So Absolutely. thanks for the detail. You're welcome. And I think when I was here before in the fall, we talked about you know, showing that data uh, a few more times other than you know, summative data because once you show it, then there's really nothing you can do with it. So we're hoping that we still have another semester that we can look at turning some of those numbers around. So that will be our um, task in terms of looking at what <coughs> things we can implement to um, reduce the number of out-of-school suspensions. And that happens to be um, the restorative practices is one of the pieces that I think is kind of going around the country. There are a lot of schools, major uh, districts in California, Chicago, and some on the East Coast that are taking this approach um, to discipline. And um, the next slide, I don't know, I guess I have the clicker here, unless somebody wants to advance. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, I'm not going to read this to you, but I just <clears throat> do want to point out two words, relational re approach, and then the bottom line says teach. And I think this restorative uh, approach is about making sure that we're restoring the, the relationships among students and sometimes between students and teachers when there's a problem. So sometimes if a student is in trouble in classroom and they get sent out, if there's no restorative piece, they come back to the class the next time and they're just as angry as they were before because nothing has happened differently. They haven't really talked about what harm was done and how they may go about making it right. Slide. Um, this is a kind of a popular slide, I guess, when I think about the injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I chose this slide because <clears throat> we want students to know that their actions are far-reaching. A lot of times they are very, very short-sighted and they think, I just did this and I just hurt this person, but they don't realize there's a domino effect. There are a lot of people that get hurt when um, there is something that happens in a school setting. Um, also wanting them to know that <clears throat> we're all in this together, students and staff and community. We need to work together. Uh, in the restorative justice, um, there are three parties that are involved and there's the victim or the person that uh, has been offended and then there's the, the offender, offender and then there's the community. And so in a school setting it could be uh, a problem between two students and there's an offender and there's a victim but then the community, the school itself is the community. So there's something that has happened that impacts that community. So it's no longer the same unless you come back together and talk about what was done and how you might go about restoring those relationships. So the question would be um, who was harmed in this situation and um, what can we do to fix it, to make it right? And justice isn't just for some people. Justice is for everyone. Um, and we all need to feel that we are uh, treated equally, 
that we are respected and that we are valued. And I think sometimes if you were asked to ask some of our students, they don't feel that all three of those apply to them. And I think that's what we need to get to, where all students and all staff feel that they are respected, that they are um, treated equally, and that they are valued. This next slide is a tale of two schools. And in a recent um, professional learning um, session that I did with some of the middle school administrators, um, this was very clear that they looked at these two scenarios and they really wanted to, us to be the type of school that's restorative. On the left, it talks about a zero tolerance, um, a zero tolerance education system. And so there's an example of Carlos who comes to school because um, he was, there was an argument at his house the morning before he left. And when he got to school, he was met, met with metal detectors and a police search. Uh, his teacher scolds him in front of the class and he talks back and now he's in detention. Uh, a school police officer detains and arrests him and the other student, and then he's held in juvenile detention uh, facility after school. On the restorative side, <clears throat> the teachers and administrators welcome him and their fellow students as they enter. So they're right there at the building at the entryway welcoming students, greeting them, letting them know that we're happy that you're here. Uh, his teacher waits until after class to speak to him, so it's more private, and then they set up a meeting that they can talk afterwards. And then the student, um, the student um, peer mediators and support team intervene, and then they kind of de-escalate the situation, and they have a conversation about it later. So at the end of the day, when Carlos has gotten into this fight with this other student in the cafeteria, the consequence is that he and the other student agree to clean up the cafeteria. That's the fix it. So we want to make sure that when things happen in our schools, that students are given an opportunity to make it right because that's a part of their learning situation. And, and they're going to face situations like this throughout life. So they need to learn how to fix those things. I understand that restorative practices won't fix everything. Um, we're still going to need to suspend students. We just hope that by practicing the restorative justice pieces that we can suspend fewer students. We can offer that as an option. Um, and most, student, most districts who have applied this have noticed a drastic reduction in their out-of-school suspensions. One of the things I try to make sure that kids understand is that their actions really don't define who they are. Um, I don't know that there are any bad kids, and if we can separate their behaviors from their person, I think we'll be better off. Uh, letting them know that we still believe in them, but we have to help them learn to make better choices. And I think that's where the education piece comes in, where we have to teach them to make those better choices. And the final slide I have, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, but I think that when you think about restorative practices, it involves everybody. So we can't just say it's all got to be the administrators or it's got to be this person or that person. I think the administrators will take a lead on it, but it really has to be for everyone. We have to really look at how we are using language when we're talking to students, um, what we're doing to make those relationships better. And when there's a breakdown, what are we doing to bring those relationships back together? So um, as I've talked with Paul, we have a plan in place that we're going to start putting some modules together, like on Canvas, so that teachers and administrators can go and look at those. We already have some videotapes that we've shown at professional learning meetings so that they kind of get an idea of what it looks like in practice. So we're hoping that with that restorative um, practice effort that we will see a reduction in our school suspensions. Did I go over my time? Thank you, Ellen. Uh, does anybody have questions for Ellen and Mary? Um, thank you. That's good information. How are parents learning about this? I'm going to call it a new style of discipline because we are changing the method from just straight up uh, suspensions and expulsions. I think we haven't had a plan right now for how we're going to do that with parents, but obviously there is a parent component. Uh, some of the things that I've been involved in this year has been been um, doing some of those restorative meetings, and some of them are parent meetings. So we kind of have an opportunity to talk with parents when they come to those meetings. Uh, and so they kind of get to feel what it's like to have those questions asked of their student. You know, what were you thinking at the time? What harm has been done? What do you think we need to do to fix this? So parents are kind of getting immersed in it as a result of their students um, being suspended and coming back for those reentry meetings. And, and my other thought is, you know, if my student were a victim of some 
activity and that the perpetrator continued to come to school and be in the same classroom as a parent, I might be concerned about that. So I think the more communication we can have in explaining what this process is and what the goals and objectives are, I think that might be helpful. And then my other question is, so is this a rollout for this 15-16 school year, or did you start this in 14-15? We started a little bit, I think, in 14-15 um, when we just had um, the administrators here, just a brief um, it was a brief workshop about it. Um, so we've also been coming to the elementary, uh, secondary um, principals meetings, talking with them more about it, showing them those videos. Um, but I think we're gonna just have to hit it really hard the next, uh, this next semester and just making sure that we get more information out to people. I have more questions, but I don't want to dominate. No, I have a question. Um, I was just wondering if there were, as Mary said, with parents, how are you rolling it out for the kids? We do the bullying programs and things, but are the kids being educated about what this restorative process is as well? Because I think that them understanding it before an incident is also very helpful. Okay, and I think that'll be a part of what we will roll out to the administrators in terms of how they might communicate that okay. with their students. I mean, right now the students that are hearing about it are the ones that are actually involved, but right. you're absolutely right. Um, if we can get that information to them prior to, I think that would be the best case scenario. So, so Ellen, just so that we're all clear, so obviously we're interested in making sure the students and the parents see what the plan is and better understand this. So. So this semester, is that kind of the goal then? We'll work through that this semester and we should have that at least well underway by the end of this semester and in place for the next school year? Or, or what's, what's kind of the horizon on this plan? That is our goal. Okay. To roll it out so that parents are aware, so that students are aware, and also so that the um, general staff is aware. I think the only people that have most of the information right now would be our administrators. And I have talked with some uh, teachers, and I know that they're ready to go and move with this, so we just have to help okay. give them the resources that they need to do that. I, th I think, you know, as a board, we'll just ask Dr. Buck that the administration come back to the board with a real specific plan of what the rollout is, because that, that seems to be of interest to the board. Absolutely. I have another question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm always concerned about staff time and are they well trained and are they equipped to handle these situations. Some of them are, are more uncomfortable and more physical than others and I, I know that you're going to train your staff. Do they have the confidence you think to, to make this a successful program? I think they do and I think also just keeping in mind that not every situation is going to be a situation that you can do the restorative practice and the other piece is that both parties have to be willing to participate in that so if there is if there is an offense taken then both sides get to decide whether or not they want to come together and do that so I think that I think they'll be equipped thank you thank you other questions so I, I mean I do think that the parent component is critical and um, I, I think the meaningful accountability component of this is very important. I think it's important for the public to understand that we as a district will do long-term suspensions, but we're, we're really not into expulsions where we just kick the kids out and don't provide any sort of learning. We do provide learning for those students that are removed um, through suspensions. And I also think that um, the, whole, the whole concept of ensuring that the students um, understand that they're making choices and consequences because that is something that they'll deal with the rest of their lives. They go on to college or they go on to workforce training or they just go right into the job force or military. They're going to have choices in front of them and there will be consequences for their actions so the earlier we can help them um, you know, through that, the better. And I always go back as a board, is there anything else that we can do um, to help support this effort beyond what we're already doing? And, you may not have any specific ideas right now, and of course funding is, is always in the mix, I'm guessing, but is there anything else that we as a board can do to support the administration in this effort? I think just supporting us as we move forward, and I think one of the key things that you just said is consequences, we wanna get away from punishment. Um, that's where we want to move away from because that's not worked for us. Um, punishment doesn't work. Uh, we see that in our systems all over the place, but we want to help students make better choices so that their consequences will be things that they can live with and learn from. Great. 
And uh, again, I think as a board, as, as we move forward and being supportive of this, any data that can, again, go back and support that this new process is working as you roll it out, is it working better uh, in terms of uh, repetitive behaviors or not repetitive behaviors in certain schools where we have these programs, I think that that would be helpful for us as we move forward supporting this. And we will have a tracking document up on Canvas and 365 that will kind of keep us aware of how many people, how many buildings are actually doing the restorative process and where they are and so that when we see that there's a need then we know to go in and give them more support. So. Awesome. Any, any other last minute questions? It's a heck of a lot cheaper for us to do it now than to send these kids into the judicial right. system for the rest of their adult life. So, yeah, I, and I, the I, consequences to yeah. their lives too right. in the right. long run is huge. And so, we appreciate all that you're doing, Ellen and Paul, and the rest of the administrative staff and team on this. So, and to the teachers and to the parents who are going to have to help implement all of this. So, and the students. Yes, and the students. Thank you so much. All right. Next, uh, we'll go ahead and move into. Our equity conversation follow-up with Paul Hayes. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you know, um, the board hosted an event on January 12th at the African American Museum that focused on the district's equity and diversity efforts. Um, as a result of that event, we gained a lot of really valuable feedback that um, I'm going to share with you some of that feedback tonight and how we intend to address it. Uh, in the days following the event, uh, several of us here at the ELSC met to review the feedback and identify some of the key themes that emerged from that evening. Um, so what I'm going to share with you tonight are those themes and some of the current and future action steps we're taking to address them. The first theme is something that was mentioned earlier tonight is in the, uh, the inclusion of student uh, voice in the conversation and how are we engaging students in uh, the discussion about their opinions and strategies around equity and diversity. So some of the things that, um, some of the ideas that, that we have moving forward, part of the discussion that evening was also about the student programming that we have. So tapping into those, those after school programs that already exist and uh, providing those students with some information and asking many of the same questions that we asked of the community that night to get students um, opinions and, and generate strategies from them because as uh, President Laverty alluded to, sometimes kids get it better than adults. So getting their voice and getting their ideas um, on the table are going to be important and to look at some of the, the themes that emerge from their conversations so that we can you know, compare those with, with the themes that, that we um, identified and see um, are we headed down the right road or are we doing the right things in the student's eyes. Uh, the next theme was um, the expansion of the district's minority recruitment efforts. And the Human Resources Department has um, for some time now had a diversity task force that was created to generate ideas and to monitor uh, district diversity. Uh, the mission statement of that group is to utilize strategies and best practices to recruit and retain highly qualified candidates with diverse backgrounds to enrich student and staff learning in the Cedar Rapids Community School District. So um, HR also um, works with uh, the city, um, the county, Civil Rights Commission to uh, look at um, recruitment and, and retention ideas. Um, and, and reach out to current students for uh, further opportunities in the district. Uh, they attend uh, recruiting fairs both locally and across the country. Um, they have plans to work with an outside consultant to get some ideas and strategies for um, enhancing the recruiting materials, um, using social media platforms for recruiting. Um, also reaching out to the historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions to partner with them to see how can we um, uh, partner with you and your uh, education programs, teacher, teacher pre preparation programs to generate some interest in the district. And then uh, just working with local agencies uh, to improve um, ideas and strategies on that uh, whole recruitment and retention idea. 
The third theme is focused on curriculum and instruction and our instructional materials that are used. And um, what we intend to do there and, and things that we have done are to provide opportunities for our curriculum facilitators to work with um, not only our district staff, but um, Edwin Javis, the um, Ed Equity Consultant, uh, to identify, um, assess, and embed culturally relevant materials into the curriculum and make sure that as we adopt new things that there are criteria that we're looking at to make sure that those things are there. Um, and then when reviewing materials, an emphasis on the continued use of tools that get at those, those characteristics of diverse uh, curriculum and evaluate the attributes of our existing materials and new materials to make sure that they, they meet those uh, criteria. And then as we move uh, toward magnet schools, um, magnet schools are focused on um, you know, addressing specific goal of reducing the subgroup isolation. So as we get more innovative programs um, embedded in the district, we'll keep an eye on um, that subgroup isolation and make sure that we are addressing that. And then staff will actively work to identify individualized learning opportunities that uh, promote and celebrate diversity through those innovative programs. And finally, but perhaps the most important theme is focused on communication. How do we get the word out there about what are the good things that the district is doing? Um, one of the things that has already occurred um, is to make the equity page on the district website more accessible through the, um, in the Our District tab. Equity is, is at the forefront of that uh, section of the website. And then working with Marsha to develop a, a district communication platform uh, that supports and celebrates diversity among our staff and students, uh, provides a vehicle for staff and students to share their stories, and displays data relevant to a diverse population. So again, that whole visibility and transparency piece, many of these things, um, as you heard, are things that currently are occurring. Uh, we just need to get better at letting people know what's happening and what the outcomes of those efforts are. I have our four themes. Very good. Questions for Paul? Mary? Um, I'm really excited about this work. I think it's meaningful and transformational for many students in our district, so I commend our district for reaching out and holding mm -hmm. that forum and taking action on the suggestions that were made. I hope that you're working with the Economic Alliance, who also has a workforce retention um, and recruitment program already in play with a lot of area businesses. So mm -hmm. just encourage you to do that. And then um, are you going to have any follow What's your plan for follow-up with this group or no follow-up? or? Well, we will we'll use the communication platform that we develop and get the outcomes of that evening's feedback posted for, for everybody to see so that, you know, as the community is looking at that and, and different themes emerge from them, they can reach out to us and say, but what about this, this thing that we're seeing over and over again in this feedback? You know, how are you addressing that? So that um, we've got the, the feedback available for everybody to, to take a look at. And then again, the, as we uh, get more and more student feedback, making that accessible so that people can see here's, here's what our students are asking for, here's what our community is saying is important. Do those things match? Good. Thank you. Other questions? So Paul, we have, um, we have a board appointed diversity committee. How does this work relate to that committee in particular? Um, actually, it was very timely because almost immediately following the event, we had a diversity committee meeting. And so we, uh, many of the, I shouldn't say many, a few of the diversity committee members attended that, the event, but most were unable to. So we basically just recreated it in a smaller format for the diversity committee that evening to get even more feedback and to see what, um, with, with their uh, targeted eye on equity and diversity, you know, what more information could they provide us? So that was added to the, the feedback then and how we um, worked to identify those themes. I think, you know, one of the 
One of the feedback um, that we've had over the years is that we, we move forward with these task forces or the ideas and then uh, we talk about it and we survey it more and nothing seems to really happen. And so at least from the indications I've received from the board, we do really want this to move forward. And you know, we have the board appointed diversity committee as kind of our set representatives to make sure that this happens. So, um, and Dr. Buck's fully aware of this. I mean, this is our intention. It's part of what we're evaluating him as a superintendent on. Mm -hmm. uh, during the coming year or so. So in speaking with Dr. Buck, I think there's some commitment on the district's part to recreate these conversations, maybe not the same format, not the same place, but you know, taking the conversation to the community um, and where we're going to generate even more, um, more input to so make it more accessible for folks. Yeah, so one of the things that maybe knits this conversation together a little bit too is the the diversity committee of the board provides significant feedback on our equity plan. So we have the equity plan, it's six dimensions, one of which is um, HR, but there's six dimensions in that. So this work is informing the next iteration of that. So as we go into the 16, 17 school year, we'll use a lot of the information that Paul has described here and some of those themes that have emerged. And then that diversity committee, so they'll review these themes and have that discussion in what way does that uh, modify and improve the equity plan going forward. So I, th I think that's part of the intersection. And then if you think about the theory of action work that's underway, mm -hmm. um, you know, equity was part of that conversation in lots of different ways on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And so as you try to think about where in a theory of action does the concept of equity fit, specifically where does the diversity committee and the diversity plan and its ultimate improvement for the next school year fit in this conversation in what way does this data set guide future ongoing and future work and so what we're really trying to do here is take uh, lots of moving parts and put it together in a way that'll make uh, even better experiences for our students so that's yeah so I think that's all kind of what we're trying to get put together here so, so you, oh, go ahead so um, how do we involve our students in these kinds of conversations? There are a lot of adults talking and, and right. sending out edicts and whatever. How can we engage them in a, in a meaningful manner? And before you answer mm -hmm. that, I have a co another comment. Um, a lot of businesses in town have ERGs, employee resource groups. I'm thinking if we can convert that to student resource groups. And, they, and each resource group has a focus of study, if you will, and of practice. And I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe there's an idea there. I just want students involved in this so that mm -hmm. they understand what equity is. It's not, it's not equal, necessarily. It's equity. Right. So, And then bringing that in with the restorative justice piece. Right. So we, we've seen different models of, of student engagement in this process um, over the last few years. Um, a couple of years ago, Washington High School did a, um, a had a spirit group, and so they and the, which still exists at Washington, where they brought together um, different sections of Washington High School that, that represented the diversity there, and just um, it, it, it's called problem solving and resolution together. So the kids just put out there, here's what we're seeing in our building. And they came up with solutions to that. And that, that's where I get the idea that sometimes kids get it better than, than adults do because they came up with some very quick and simple ideas to things that we've been wrestling with for years. So um, that group still exists at Washington as kind of an advisory, student advisory group. Um, the idea I talked about would be taking students and, and talking to the students who are currently in our AAAP and, and rites of passage programs, our LBA program, the academy, and, and using that um, already existing group of students to to ask some of those questions and get their input and say how do we move this forward what what are the adults not thinking of and just last week uh, Jefferson High School uh, provided a uh, an opportunity with Edwin Javis to have students actually um, work with and, and answer some questions about uh, the impact on them of the the diversity and equity things that they are are seeing in their building and in the district. So, lots of different ways that we can do that. We just need to uh, formalize those and and spread the the wealth, if you will, a little bit further, so that we're including um, the students that we need to hear from. I think it might be helpful for us as a board, and I don't want to speak for everyone necessarily, but 
to have an accounting, so to speak, an inventory of what the district is actually doing um, in regards to all of this work already. So we know that we're supporting um, several outside groups that help at, with after school programs. We know that we're supporting uh, programs within the school district. There's some things that you just mentioned that some of the schools are doing internally during the school day that are supportive of uh, creative solutions. And so we know that we're already doing a lot and um, this is a big puzzle and there's obviously some pieces missing to it. It sort of ties in with the set task force as well. So I think there's work with that. Um, finding where are these gaps, where are the, where are the missing pieces. Um, so it's, re it's really sort of, um, you know, uh, an analysis of, of the gaps um, in this. And, and what will that cost us, either in terms of personnel and time and effort or whatever, to, uh, to move those things forward? That's, that's sort of a large task. But again, I think as a board, we need to understand what the timeline is for that. So is this, is this a... You know, an ongoing effort, we're going to have a, the bulk of this done by the end of this spring semester. Is it going to go into the next school year? And again, so as an administration, we'll just ask Dr. Buck to make sure that, that we're kept apprised of that. Um, and for me personally, in terms of the HR effort, a lot of what you talked about are things that I've heard about since I've been on the board for nine years. And um, I, I did hear maybe reaching out with some of the traditionally um, black or Latino colleges and universities. But you know, we've, we've gone to college fairs around the country and we've brought in minority candidates and they've, they've left the school district after a couple of years. I mean, there's, there's cultural things just about moving further away um, from their homes and uh, percentages of, uh, of their, their race or background here. And there's, there's all kinds of issues I've heard of uh, with that. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, we have a substantial population of minority students now in our district, a very diverse group of students here. What are we doing internally to help grow that population into potential future teachers and leaders within our school district? And I, I guess as a parent, as somebody in the community, instead of spending a ton of money out there trying to recruit from far and away, um, what, what can we do with our own students um, to help them succeed to, to be those future leaders in our schools and teachers? So right. I just put that challenge out there as well. Any, anything else? I support anyone? that same challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Challenge accepted. <laughs> all right. Well, we appreciate all that you're doing. Now it's a big task, but um, it is critical to us, and it's one of our top priorities. So thank you so much. All right. Um, with, with that, I will uh, remind the board that um, you have your calendar as an information item, so please take a look at that and do your meeting evaluations. The board will be moving into closed session for evaluation of professional competency in accordance with the Code of Iowa, Section 21.51I. Um, would there be a motion uh, for that closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. This is a roll. Director Meisterling? Aye. Director Jansen? Aye. Director Jacobo? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. President Laverty? Aye. With that, the meeting is closed. <laughs>